party tonight. What? TV party tonight. Oh, we got nothing better to do than watch TV and have a couple of brews. Don't want to talk about anything else. We don't want to know. We're dedicated yes. to our favorite shows. Oh, my tickets. Everybody loves him, Photo. Scary dog. Dancing at Blurred Ball. Futurama. Good evening. You are listening to a American Whammy podcast production. Yes. Uh, W2M Network is merging with American Whammy Productions and will eventually become American Whammy Media. Therefore, we here at Rattledge and Broadcasting, that's me, will be doing the same. So everything involved with W2M and Rattledge and Broadcasting will become an American Whammy podcast. And I am said rattledge your host a mandated reporter and frankly i'm mortified and tonight our favorite shows are game changer wrestling blood yeah. sport eight <laughs> and for the culture 2022 sorry natural uh, response anytime somebody says wrestling yay <laughs> yay and that is my fellow indie cider big sexy harry broadhurst how do you do sir i do well how about yourself mark Oh, just dandy. So we're talking about blood sport. We're talking about for the culture. I was interested in these two events um, after Effie's big gay brunch, which we talked about a few weeks ago. Uh, I've been following the blood sport event since Pat Mullen actually turned me on to it. Uh, it used to be Matt Riddle, and now it's Josh Barnett's, and I've watched almost all of them. The, I mean, vi- the very first one was Matt Riddle, and then he got signed. So Josh yeah. Bar- Josh Barnett took over as the namesake, starting with the second one. I, and I think I've watched all, at least all the Josh Barnett ones. I may have missed one here or there, but for the most part, I've seen them. I've seen at least six out of eight of these, and I really like it. I mean, you know me; I I come from watch, uh, being a fan of mixed martial arts. I like combat sports. You know, on on the occasion I'm not at a sex club or something, I like to do the uh, the the boxing commentaries or whatnot. So. I like my combat sports, and you and I have been talking wrestling for a little while now. You know that I like when wrestling looks like wrestling and not like, you know, young bucks, flippity-doo, whatever. Um, So with that being said, I really got into the whole blood sport concept. I like the work shoot aspect of it. Uh, You messaged me after watching this, and you said you were not a fan. Um, Okay, so the last couple of matches picked up. Mm -hmm. and it was much more consistent towards the style that I would want to see from a promotion doing UWFI rules. I don't know Mm -hmm. how familiar you are with UWFI. It was a Japanese hybrid shoot promotion that people Mm -hmm. like little Guido Maritato used to work for back in the 90s. One could argue it's the spiritual predecessor to Bloodsport. Um, Mm -hmm. Another independent promotion in Indiana, Paradigm Pro Wrestling, does a lot of UWFI role matches as well. So it's very similar in concept. Though I think they have a full standard wrestling ring and not kind of the uh, the ring with uh, the ring ropes and turnbuckles that you see at Bloodsport. Yeah. All right. So let's kick it off here. Um, let's pull up the results. All right. The first match uh, was Masha Slamovich, which is a great name. <laughs> Just Agreed. Great. Just a great name, Masha Slamovich versus uh, Janai Kai, and she tapped her with an arm cross arm breaker at four minutes and thirty seven seconds. Uh, I'd be curious to see what you thought of this because I've, it, I think it took about two or three events before they started having girls on these things, and I remember Pat Mullen and I not loving it. Um, that a lot of the women seem to struggle with the whole work shoot concept. Well, and I think it, it's and it's hang on, it's getting better. And I think this one wasn't nearly as bad as some of the ones I've seen before, where I think there was like one woman from Ring of Honor uh, at an early one of these, and she seemed to really struggle with the concept. These two, it looked tighter than the other women I've seen do this. I thought this was pretty good. So the issue that I have, uh, and I, I, I know what you're referring to because we've kind of seen it in the past, that a lot of times when it comes to exchanging strikes and stuff, women tend mm-hmm. to struggle. Women performers tend to struggle with making their strikes look crisp. Yeah. There are exceptions. Asuka, obviously. Sure. Uh, Bian- Bianca Belair is one of the best forearm throwers in wrestling. 
So you know, there are exceptions to that rule, but traditionally when it comes to the hand-to-hand -hand standing combat, uh, females tend to struggle in terms of straight up strike-for-strike uh, -strike exchanges. Uh, Slamovich is a tr trained former MMA fighter, so it's not a surprise that she was able to adapt to the Bloodsport style. Janai Kai, I believe, actually has kickboxing training, so it was not a surprise that she was able to adapt to the MMA style. The biggest throw for me here was the fact that there weren't rounds in this uh, event, mm -hmm. and it was just straight one fall to a finish going straight through without any kind of a break in between. I was just curious as to what you thought about that. Um, to be honest with you, I didn't, I don't think it even registered with me. The only thing that I thought was, is they did it to save time because if yeah. you have like those 30 second rest breaks in between like three minute rounds and stuff, then mm -hmm. some of these matches are going to tack on another four or five minutes yeah. in terms of production and time. I'll tell you, this is a night, nice, this one and for the culture were both nice. Yeah. You know, at least I watched them. I didn't watch them live. I didn't, um, I watched them taped. And, uh, you know, so they cut out a lot of the breaks in between, but they still came in in about two, two and a half hours, which given, you know, having sat through the Joey Janela thing and some of these other uh, some of these other independent shows like these were nice and tight. Two twenty seven thirty nine for for blood sport. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then two sixteen for for the culture. All right. Uh, next one was Ninja Mac. Ninja Mac was all over the collective that weekend. Jesus Christ. He's on like every show. Um, Ninja Mac had a ref stop against Yoya with a four, for the 540 kick at 605. So I told you I have a friend who um, I, I comes over and watch rest, watches wrestling with me. And uh, I showed her this, and I remember like that kick shocked us both. Like we were, we it, it seemingly came out of nowhere and it looked brutal as fuck. See, I actually didn't like the kick. What didn't you like Be about it? I didn't like the fact that you could clearly tell that Yo Yo was leaning into it. Mm -hmm. Like, I you, we we talked about the idea of the work shoot concept of blood sport, mm -hmm. and yeah. and I get that. But my problem is is if it's obvious that it's a work shoot, then don't have it as a work shoot. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean that kind of goes to what we were saying about the women. Like some of them, they don't know how. You know, they're so used to the showy pro wrestling style, they really don't know how to make it and gritty. Yeah, and Ninja Mac and Yo Yo are both two relatively young performers. I did appreciate mm -hmm. the fact that Ninja Mac took the concept of blood sport seriously and demasked before the match. I thought that was, uh, I thought that was quite the talking point coming out of this. Yeah, um, I think Ninja Mac did an okay job with it. Um, your your criticism of the kick there at the end—I mean, it seemed brutal to me, but I won't argue with you that maybe Yo Yo, -Yo telegraphed it a bit, and that is sort of the. That's some of the subtlety of working blood sport is you really, really have to take an extra moment and, you know, and make it look like a struggle. You know, if you're, uh -huh. if you're, if it looks too much like you're cooperating, it destroys the whole thing. It's, it's all about uh, protecting the illusion. All right. Hoist Isaacs tapped bad dude Tito with a rolling guillotine at five minutes and 37 seconds. I barely remember this. Uh, I barely remember it as well, but I will say this much. Uh, Royce Isaacs would have been a star had ROH not gone down. What makes you say that? He was one of those guys that was in the pure division mm -hmm. uh, that was currently championed at that time by the goods, Josh Woods, mm -hmm. and that is now currently held by Wheeler Yuta. Uh, okay. Isaacs. You, is, I caught part of like on TikTok the, that Wheeler Yuta John Moxley match. What the hell, man? Have you seen this? Uh, the one from Rampage? I guess, yeah. The one yeah, where, where you really it, Yuta's a bloody mess? Yeah, it's the one where Yuta officially becomes a member of the BCC. It's the Blackpool, BCC. Blackpool Combat Club. Oh, okay. Oh, Regal's, Regal's group. Okay. Regal's group in AEW, yeah. yeah. I am so out of the loop now with, with AEW. Um, but, it's uh, funny when I do Double or Nothing, I have no idea what's going on. Well, you won't really need to know what's going on. The matches will usually speak for themselves when it comes to sure. AEW pay-per-views. All right, but back to uh, back to Royce Isaacs and Bad Dude. Bad Dude mm -hmm. Tito, I've seen a little bit of on NJPW Strong. Like, mm -hmm. you know me. I'm not the world's biggest New Japan fan, and that just has to do with the fact that there's so much wrestling to consume that I kind of have to pick and choose what I do and don't watch. And since I don't watch a ton of New Japan actual I'm not going to watch their offshoot as much either. 
But uh, Isaacs, I remember from Ring of Honor, and he was somebody who was starting to break out right as Ring of Honor shut their doors. All right, next one. Uh, Alex Coughlin KO'd Slade. Slade got a big reaction at this show. People were loving him this weekend. Coughlin's another one of those. Three minutes and 38 seconds. Sorry, go ahead. Coughlin's another one of those NJPW guys. He's one of those young lions from NJPW. Him and uh, Carl Fredericks or the mm-hmm. two big uh, young lions on NJPW Strong. Um, I like the idea that Slade didn't really treat this as an M- M- MMA fight. He treated it more as a fight. He more mm-hmm. or less tried to punch Alex Coughlin in the face and got caught. <laughs> yeah, I, I vaguely remember that now. Um, and it did not go well for him. I can appreciate the storytelling in that. Yeah, and that's that's also the trick with Bloodsport is that – after a while, it all kinds of gets. It, it it can be if you're not careful, get a little samey. So it, you, you have to be careful. You have to. Uh, there was one in the past where, like, I think it was the very first time John Moxley did a blood sport, and he very much was John Moxley about it, where he kept getting out of the ring, and they were like fighting on the outside, and you know, Jim Cornette likes to criticize John Moxley. He's like, oh, well, he's a garbage wrestler, and I, it, John Moxley put his own spin on the blood sport concept, which I thought was good. And I think you have to do that for these events. You have to be able right. to stand out in order to be able to carry them. Because like you said, otherwise you're running the risk of here's, here's a plate of mashed potatoes and here's a plate of mashed potatoes and here's right. a plate of mashed potatoes. Yeah. Uh, next one we have Johnny blood sport, um, John Morrison who tapped Simon Gotch. With a guillotine choke in five minutes and fifty-seven seconds, this was excellent. This was probably one of the better ones on this show. I was curious to see how John Morrison would handle this because, again, WWE trained guy, and it's not like he, you know, left and went somewhere where there was more like work shoots. I mean, he went to Impact for a while. You know, he's done indie stuff. He's 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 always been a very gymnastic uh, kind of wrestler. You know, he was the one who did a lot of, like, flippity doos. He was kind of in that Dolph Ziggler camp of he would bump his ass off for people. So owner, I was curi- owner of the worst finishing move in pro wrestling history. Um, so I was curious to see what he would do here where, for a guy like this, this, is, this has to be a, a level of difficulty that you might not be prepared for. It's like, I think people, like, take the gig. You know, they want the exposure. They want the, you know, they, they want the clout for being kind of a badass to be in these work mm-hmm. shoes. But I, I, but I don't think he knew what he was getting himself into, and I think he handled it as best he could. But I don't think he quite knew what to do with this. See, I actually think it worked out pretty well by based on who they chose as his opponent or somebody mm-hmm. that he would have worked with before in the WWE. Yeah, I think Simon Gotch definitely carried him in this match. Yeah, and that's kind of been Simon's MO ever, uh, back when he was Simon Grimm going into the independence mm-hmm. and then recently getting the rights to the Simon Gotch ring name and ha- having the availability to use it on the indies like he did in the WWE as part of the VOD villains. Um, it gives him that sense of notoriety and that sense of exposure that also allows somebody like, sorry, I had a really bad itchy nose the last couple of days. You're fine. Um it gives somebody like Morrison the comfort level of being able to work with somebody who he's familiar with how they work. He's familiar with how they wrestle. He's familiar with how they format, how they exercise, how they use the ring and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it allows Morrison to, or excuse me, Johnny Bloodsport to use uh, air quotes on a video podcast, to audio with audio listeners. Um, It allows uh, Hennigan, uh, John, Johnny Morrison, John, Johnny Bloodsport, Johnny Nitro, call him what you want to. It allows him to have a level of comfort having a familiar opponent. Yeah, was, I think that's absolutely right. I, and I think, I, I think Gotch, who, who gets the Bloodsport concept, you know, he's he's definitely a shooter kind of wrestler. And I think he was able to kind of get John through it. The other thing, John has to now make up for the, you know, so much of what his arsenal is is off the top rope stuff. And now you don't have ropes to work off of. Not only yeah. that, a lot of his arsenal is also that uh, is a lot of that parkour inspired stuff, which yeah. in a shoot fight situation just looks freaking stupid. Yeah, um, but good match though. I thought I thought they, that worked out well. All right, yeah, Marina I, I would say so. 
Marina Shafir with a ref stop against Zeta Zhang. Um, a three and one stretch at seven minutes and 52 seconds. I, I, it's so funny. I, of the two, the two goons that, um, what's a uh, Shayna Baszler had with her in NXT. I always thought the, uh, the, the, the taller glass of water with, with, with her was, I thought she was going to end up being something. I can't believe those two got cut and they never really got out of the gate. And in NXT, they were Shayna's goons and then Shayna got called up and then they got, you know, they, they were part of one of the series of roster cuts. Um, Marina Shafir looked different here. Like, I barely recognized her. Like, I don't know. Something about her look changed. Um, so, Marina is Mrs. Roderick Strong. Yep. Uh, she just had a kid, like, last year. Mm-hmm. So, the, so, to be back in as good a shape as she's in, even all mm-hmm. things considered, is impressive. Yeah, I wasn't. Uh, that wasn't the comment, uh, negative or positive, about like her body, her, her body shape. I, I honestly didn't recognize her at first because I remember, I, uh, Jasmine Duke, that's her name. Like Jasmine Duke, Jasmine, very, Jasmine Duke, Jasmine Duke had a very distinctive look. She was a tall drink of water. She was blonde. She was pretty. She was rail like model thin, and then Marina Shafar, Shafir had, um, had a distinctive look to her too. And I'm watching this, and I swear to God, it doesn't look like her. I don't know. I don't know what was different, but it didn't look like her. Um, Maybe it's, so, been a while, it's been a while since I've seen her. So I'm about to lose at least some of my credit as a wrestling fan for this next comment. Mm-hmm. Is it just me, or did this match center around showing off Zeta Zhang's ass as much as humanly possible? No, the girl I was with at the time who was watching it with me kind of said the same thing. Okay, because don't get me wrong. I was a huge fan of her. Mm-hmm. Uh when she uh she was uh briefly in the wwe um mm-hmm. i'm trying to remember what her or her nxt name was but unfortunately it's not coming to me so i'm gonna have to look it up but um she was briefly in the wwe and i remember her standing out to me in the wwe as well because of the descent that she is i believe she's like chinese american if mm-hmm. i'm not mistaken so, like, she has a unique background in terms of her WWE run. She was in uh, MLW for a while briefly as well. Mm-hmm. And this match got put together at the last episode of Bloodsport, Bloodsport 7, which I think happened over SummerSlam weekend or Survivor Series weekend, one of the two, mm-hmm. late la- last year. So this was one of the few matches on this entire card that was actually built to instead of just randomly happening. But it just seemed like uh, instead of dressing for a fight, Zeta dressed to impress mm-hmm. and dressed to show off her dressed to show off her physique. Uh, next one we got your Yuya Yamura tapped Mike Bailey with a cross arm breaker. Uh, do you remember this one at all? I remember being surprised that Bailey lost, and uh, Yuya ca- caught Bailey with the. Uh, with a cross arm breaker after Bailey had a uh, Yuya in a rear naked choke. Mm-hmm. He was able to roll out from the rear naked choke into the cross arm breaker for the tap. You did skip a match though. Oh, no, I skip. JR Kratos and Timothy Thatcher. Oh, this one was really good. Yeah. Um, it was good to it's see the first, Timmy- the first blood in blood sport too. Yeah, this was a good, this was a really good one. I'm glad you pointed out that I stopped it. I, I missed it rather. Um, yeah, J.R. Kratos ref stop against Timothy Thatcher. I, I really, really, really liked Timothy Th- Thatcher when he was in NXT. I was like, he had a good feud with Matt Riddle there for a little bit, and um, he had some good matches with Ciampa. And you know, like, he was just this puggish uh shooter. And I'm, I, I, I know the WWF, the WWE doesn't like, like guys like him. You know, they want younger, they want not wrestlers, they they don't want puggish shooters anymore. But he was such a like the time that he spent wrestling in NXT were some of my like favorite uh favorite matches to watch. I, I, I miss Timothy Thatcher, so it was fun to see him here. I specifically remember the match with Riddle where they did the teeth spot, then that yeah. stood out so much to me. And obviously, knowing Thatcher the way that we do, we knew that that was gimmicked. But still, to somebody that maybe doesn't have the background information on Thatcher that people like us might have, not knowing that it puts over Riddle as a complete badass because he kicked this dude so hard his teeth came out. You know? Yeah. And yeah, was he was stuff. 
he was spitting chiclets. Um, the big thing for this match to me was that headbutt that Kratos delivered that busted uh, Thatcher open hard way. Mm -hmm. um, all right. PSA. Stop doing headbutts in wrestling. Okay. Can't stand them. Nobody wins. What, do you, what did you like about headbutts? Nobody wins. It's stupid. It's a classic wrestling move. It's permanent damage to your person. I mean, when you're jumping off the top rope a la Chris Benoit, sure. But I mean, not, you know. Not even just that. Even the short distance headbutts. Like McIntyre's class cow kiss I'm okay with because that's a gimmicked headbutt. Mm -hmm. He's like hitting you in the shoulder blade with it. So it's not. The shoot head on head headbutts, they need to stop knowing what we know about concussions. That's fair. All right, moving ahead. Um, so I was really surprised this wasn't the main event. Uh, Josh Barnett tapped Jonah. Jonah, formerly, what's his face from um, Bronson NXT. Reed? Bronson Reed. Yeah, I was. Uh, I, I and that's the other thing is I really thought they put Bronson Reed over here. I'm like my God, like when the, when he was part of that group that got cut. I think that was one that had surprised me the most because he had just had a run with the North American title and all of that. He was the, one of these guys out of Evolve that they were pushing heavily. Like he was part of that like um, uh, breakout tournament and all of that. The belief was he was about to be called up to the main roster. Yeah, and then he was gone again. So it was nice to see him here. I'm just surprised they didn't take the opportunity to put him over because I think right now he carries a lot of like cachet with fans who feel like he got done dirty by the WWE. But and, and why does and why does Josh Barnett of all people need a win here? Uh, because I would argue that this isn't exactly Jonah's style of match. So he got caught in the heel hook. Because mm -hmm. uh, uh, similar to what you were talking about with Moxley, Jonah spent a lot of the earlier part of the earlier part of the show like taking a step back, going out to the floor, gathering himself and trying to figure out what was what. Mm -hmm. Because this is a format that he was unfamiliar with as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that excuse me. I think that this is a situation that allows for uh, allows for somebody like Josh Barnett to be able to catch a Jonah in that heel hook there. And like you could see Jonah trying to fight it, trying to fight it, trying to fight it, and then realizing mm -hmm. that he was caught and having to tap. Uh Okay, John Moxley KO'd Biff Busick with the running knee strike. Uh, Biff Busick was what Oni Lorkin? Correct. Okay, yeah. Um, I, Biff, had heard, I had heard about this match. Like, like my friends who were into wrestling and were following some of the collective stuff over the weekend. This this was a big deal. People were digging this match. Uh, language alert: Biff Busick was fucking gushing during this match yeah there was a lot of blood during this match like an uncomfortable amount of blood yeah abusic looked like a stabbing victim like one of those things you'd see in a <laughs> jason Voorhees movie yeah you mean halloween uh friday the 13th halloween jason. is my yeah, 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 halloween right, right, is right, right. michael myers you're right you're right you're right you're right um sorry it's late you're good uh, but yeah this was I mean, again, as far as differentiating himself from the previous matches, they did a good job with it. Again, John Moxley, you know, for all the crap that John Moxley I think, gets from people like Cornette, I think he's smart about the business. He's smart about construction of a card and how to differentiate matches. And you know, and being being the semi main event, you want to give right. something people are talking about. And having this particular match here with the running knee strike, which was William Regal's knee trembler. Let's not mm -hmm. lose this. Let's not lose the sight of that as well. So he's calling out because Mox came out wearing a Blackpool Combat Club hoodie. Mm -hmm. They recently just released those over on AEW shop. So uh, Moxley bringing kind of his AEW persona to the independents here, and we would see Mox again. A little bit later in the evening, because let's not forget, he did this match against uh, Biff Busick, where him and Busick beat the shit out of each other. Yep. And then he turned around later that night and wrestled AJ Gray with the GCW World Heavyweight title on the line at Spring That's Break right. Night 1. Yeah, well, I mean, we were saying that before with uh, Ninja Mac, where a lot of these guys that worked the collective worked multiple shows, and there was multiple shows in a day. I think it was four or five per day. Uh, four per day. Okay. Uh, speed, speedball Mike Bailey's another example too. Right. 
Yeah, this was, I mean, I'm sure for a lot of these guys, this was a fun weekend. This was a fairly well paying for an independent weekend. You know, working WrestleMania is always a big deal. So, you know, you always get a crowd. But that's also, that's a lot, that's a lot of, that's a lot of wear and tear in a very short period of time, you know? It's a case where you kind of have to pick and choose the bookings you're going to take in order to be able to preserve yourself for those bookings. Because I know certain people, when the collective, the actual GCW collective, the one that ran alone in Indianapolis, Mm -hmm. I know that there were certain people at that collective show that were on out of the 12 shows. I think there were, there were certain people that I know that were on like 9, 10, 11 of the shows. Yeah. Which is just insanity to me. That's, that's a long weekend. All right. And in your main event, Dirty Daddy, Chris Dickinson took on Death Grandpa, Minoru Suzuki with elbow strikes, nine minutes and 45 seconds. Uh, they told a good story here. I thought, uh, it, I know, I, I guess the, the reason why this was the main event was because it was Suzuki, uh, who's all over the place. This and they also a rematch from a previous Bloodsport 2 where Suzuki beat Dickinson. Yep. Um, I like, you know, we've talked about this before, how much I like the Dirty Daddy. I thought him and Suzuki, you know, the last time and I made it and this is the one the the clip that I made for uh, for TikTok, you know, the F.E. Suzuki match was such its own thing. Uh, But it was also nice here to see Suzuki really in his element because of all the guys that wrestled on this besides Josh Barnett, probably nobody was made for blood sport more than Minoru Suzuki. The question becomes out of this is what are they able to do with Dickinson out of it after the allegations that have recently broken against him? What's happened now? Uh, he's being accused of sexual assault. Okay. So is this like a Matt Riddle thing where the, where the woman has no credibility? Or is this like uh, a... This is, what, this what's is close. What, 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 Dick Spot guy. What's his name? Joey, Joey Ryan? Yeah, or is it a Joey Ryan thing where it's like, close. no, no, he's a sexual... He's, he's a sex pervert closer to a David Starr thing where it's believed that it's true, but it hasn't been officially proven yet. And that also be a Joey Ryan thing. Uh, no, Ryan was confirmed guilty. Like there were people oh, okay. that saw it happen. Okay. Gotcha. All right. Well, ugh. yeah. I mean, if Chris, if Chris Dickinson's proven to be a sex pervert, not a whole lot. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> pretty much you're, you're pretty much done. Um, overall, I like I like blood sport. I had a good time with it. The woman I watched it with had a good time watching it. Uh, I like this kind of wrestling. I don't think I could watch it too much. I, I think the, the quarterly blood sport show is worth it is plenty. Like not that long ago, I think it was maybe six and seven. They ran like within a day of each other. And that was a little too much in, in one sitting, you know, one show, two, two and a half hours. Um, and then I don't have to see this again for four or five months is, is plenty with blood sport. I'll give you the final word and we'll move on to for the culture. Yeah. I, I think that this is a case of know your audience, get in, get your shit in, get out. Yeah. Don't overstay your welcome, especially if you're going to try to do this style of match. And if you are going to try to push boundaries, make it look good. Uh, I go back to what I said about match number two between Ninja Mac and Yoya. I did not care for that 540 kick at the finish because the way that Yoya leaned into it just took me right out of the match. All right. Um, let's take a pause for the cause and talk to you about Grammarly. For you listeners of the American Whammy Media Production Podcast and TV Party Tonight, Grammarly is offering a free download of the Grammarly software. Grammarly say powered products help people communicate more effectively. Grammarly helps you write mistake free on Gmail, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and nearly anywhere else you write on the web. Grammarly corrects hundreds of grammar punctuation and spelling mistakes while also catching contextual errors, improving your vocabulary, and suggesting style improvements. You download Grammarly today. Go to getgrammarly.com slash W2M Network. Again, it's getgrammarly.com slash W2M Network to download Grammarly for free. All right. And that brings us to For the Culture um, 2022, which is the all African American. Uh, showcase for uh, African-American wrestlers. It started off with an impact knockout championship with between Tasha Steele, old twerky butt versus klutzy, big swole. Um, I'm not going to lie. I barely watched this. <laughs> what I saw uh, it didn't seem too bad, but I'm not. But again, maybe maybe big swole. I, I've already yeah. been on record as saying big swole is the klutziest, most awkward female wrestler I've seen. And she deserved to be cut from AEW. Was she any better here? Did she her and no. Tasha work together? Okay, no, this was also a klutzy mess. 
you know, for as talented as her husband is, she has mm -hmm. none of his athletic ability. Okay. Um, her, hus her husband is Cedric Alexander, if you don't I, know. I, I remember. All right. Yeah, talk uh, talk Tasha, I, Tasha, I like. Tasha has impressed me. Tasha mm -hmm. is also coming off the biggest win of her career, uh, having just beaten Mickey James at No Surrender for the Impact Knockouts title. You know, of her and, and Kira Hogan, I thought Kira Hogan was the better worker. Um, I thought Tasha Steele had a lot of character to her, had a lot of pizzazz, but I, I, I preferred Kira Hogan's work. Well, you're starting to see more of Kira in AEW now that she's joined up with part as part of Jay Cargill's crew. Oh, has she? Her and uh, Red Velvet are the baddies. Oh, okay. Oh, her and Red, Red Velvet will probably make a really killer tag team. I think that's the idea behind it. I wouldn't be surprised to see AEW introduce women's tag titles. Sure. They were kind of kind of had that intention when uh, they did the women's tag team tournament. And then Ivelisse went and did Ivelisse things running her mouth and got herself fired. Next up was the seven-way scramble match. Michael Oku defeats... And Dino and Carly Bravo and Judiz and Kata and PB Smooth and Trey Shaw. Um, go ahead and tell me what you thought of this one. This was, I, I, I'm getting to a point now with, especially with GCW, where if I see multi man matches, I cut my eyes just kind of glaze over and I end up like watching out of a corner of my eye, but focusing on something else. It was okay. Yeah. Uh, Michael, so, I mean, like it's hard to even rate these things because after a while, it's like it's just a bunch of guys running around doing stuff. Michael Oku is actually very good. He's somebody off of the British independent scene. The mm -hmm. uh, o Osmo, o O-S-M-O, uh, junior, British junior heavyweight champion, and he is super talented. The uh, guy that stood out in this match to me, obviously, was PB Smooth, but again, I have a lot of familiarity with PB Smooth, so mm -hmm. uh, I, I go back to his days in AIW when he was tag team champions with Hornswoggle. Yes, that's a real sentence. <laughs> and right. it was it was hilarious. They called themselves twins. All right. Next one is O'Shea Edwards and Shane Taylor defeating uh, Shane Tahuti Taylor Miles, promotions to Tahuti Miles and Top Dollar. Um, when Taylor pins Miles at eleven minutes and twenty nine seconds. Uh, I think if this is the one with the with the four like really heavy dudes. Um, well Three really heavy dudes into yeah. Miles, who was yeah, a yeah, strong yeah, yeah. Player. That's what, yeah. I love this match. Like I, I'm, I, I'm sad, but I'm so tired that it, it took me a minute to register which one this was. But yeah, this was big meaty men slapping meat. This was this and the Hoodfoot match were my favorite matches of this entire show. It made it the whole thing worth it. Uh, Tahuti Miles was known as Ashanti the Adonis in NXT. Right, top, he was part top, of the hit, hit row, right? Yeah, these are actually him and Top Dollar both were. Mm -hmm. The two gentlemen you see front and center on the uh, For the Culture poster behind me. If you want to mm -hmm. do me a favor real quick and pull my video off screen. Okay. Oh, hang on. The guy in the fr the you ball can't... cap at the, at the center okay. right it's there. It's not going to hear you talk when when, when it's like that. Um... Oh, because you, you had to put me backstage. That's okay. But um, the guy in the center is top dollar. He wrestled mm -hmm. as Franck, AJ Francis, on this show. Mm -hmm. Next to him is BFAB, Bianca Brady. And then on the left side of uh, Top Dollar, there is Ashanti Adonis, gotcha. who's going back by his independent name, the name that he used when he originally came to 205 Live, which was this, Tahuti Miles. This was a lot of fun, this match. The, 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 this was everything I like about like non work shoots. This was just big old men hitting big power moves and just crushing each other. It was This was great. This was a lot of fun. Uh, AJ Francis, all six foot ten and three hundred plus pounds of him, did a moon salt mm -hmm. press. Yeah, he and did. it was and it was freaking gorgeous. Yeah, no, this was good. This was easily the best match on this card outside of the main event. Um, like a lot of this was kind of nondescript to me. Like we're doing it because of the kind of show that it is. But I'm I'm happy now that we are because I got to focus on that match and that I, I honestly could have stopped watching after that and I've been just as satisfied. Yeah. I was really impressed at how much work uh, Ashanti and uh, top dollar put into, especially given this was kind of their outside of, I think an appearance for Maryland championship wrestling were all four members of it row, the hit makers as they were calling themselves on the Indies. Um, right. All four of them were back together for that. 
but mm-hmm. with Swerve's obligation, Swerve wasn't able to be at this yeah. particular show. All right, match number four is your Pan African World Diaspora title. Trish Adora pins MJ Jenkins with the Lake Nelson clutch. I barely remember this. Um, so I just watched the Life of. It's a series on IWTV. I don't know if you had a chance to check it out. Any of them out? No. When you okay, well, when you, if you get a chance, it's well worth it because it's kind of a peek behind the curtain of independent wrestlers in mm-hmm. their personal lives. And I just watched the one about Trisha Dora. Trisha Dora was the one who wrestled Dark Sheik on the show where they were both smoking pot. Gotcha. Th- that we, we talked about before. Yeah. And there was actually a kind of a reasoning behind that. Trisha Dora is a war veteran, Trisha Dora has really bad PTSD and has trouble sleeping. So it's medically prescribed which is allows me to be a little bit more inclined to be okay with the fact that she uses it it's not simply recreational well you're awfully judgy i okay you do realize you can you can not partake but not judge others for partaking i (laughs) it's it's a sore subject for me all right i'm not gonna argue with you about it but you're a little judgy well, go ahead. Well, go ahead. Throw me on TikTok. I don't care. Come at me, bro. <laughs> Throw you on TikTok. Um, but uh, so getting kind of an insight into the character, though, it it it, it gave me a, a little bit more reasoning behind it. I hated the spot. We talked about this when it happened, yeah. and, and I explained why I hated it there. But now I have kind of an understanding as far as it goes. The match with MJ Jenkins. This was MJ Jenkins' first match on a big stage mm-hmm. in like two and a half years, because she got released from her WWE contract got injured right after she got released, and then right as she was ready to come back, got injured again. It's <laughs> awful timing. All right. Um, AJ Gray, who also had a very busy weekend, pinned Darius he Lockhart did. with side headlock takeover to the deep cradle at 10 minutes and 28 seconds. AJ Gray kicks ass. You know, he's big, tough guy, big, meaty man, slapping meat. Uh, I was... get a pretty good, pretty decent match with Darius Lockhart. I was actually more impressed by Lockhart here. Mm-hmm. I think Blockhart is somebody who doesn't get nearly the amount of credit that he, that he deserves. And there was another person on this show that has a lot in common with Lockhart. And as a matter of fact, they were a tag team in progress over for like when progress had their triple shot weekend. And that's Shug D. Mm-hmm. He, he did commentary for this show and basically carried the commentary booth. We'll talk about that in a few moments, but we saw Shug, we heard Shug's voice throughout the entire show there. And then Lockhart had the match with AJ Gray. And I actually thought that Lockhart more than held his own against one of the guys who's considered one of the faces of GCW and AJ Gray. Can we talk about the commentary team for a second? There was a lot. Most of it I thought was not great. It seemed it's, I don't like it when the commentary feels unnatural, like everyone just trying way too hard. And that was definitely a big, but there was a great line about this. And and I want to give credit where credit's due. I don't want to just bash the commentary team entirely. Like they did nothing right. One of them had a great line that said, before we were wrestlers, before we were managers, before Shug. we were referees, we were first, we were black. That and was I, Shug. And did, yeah. And I did appreciate that line. I thought, I thought that was a good line, but the rest of it was just like, so my it, issue it felt it, it felt like when a director is like doing a movie with an all black cast and they were like we want you to be blacker can you can you know help can you be blacker and it's like it's an insulting thing to say to a black actor it's 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 it you know it, it deals in stereotypes it deals in some not nice things and it feels like like they were like okay well we're doing this all black showcase wrestling event we have to sound as black as possible and it's like you don't why don't you just be yourselves like why why do you have to turn it up a notch and i think that was the biggest issue that i had with the commentary mm-hmm. on this show i thought shug crushed it but in fairness mm-hmm. i've been a fan of shug d for years so i'm not surprised there mm-hmm. Faye jackson and ac mac added absolutely nothing at commentary <sighs> oh, excuse me um all right uh the fatal four-way was Mysterious Q defeating Brian Keith, JTG, formerly of uh, Crime Time, and Zen Shi at eight minutes and eight seconds. Again, I, I, I you already had the seven way scramble. Did we need a four way match too? Okay, so you'll notice I have a note on this match if you take a look on your uh, format there, real quick. Yes, talking point is the lack of Scorpio and Swan. It was actually supposed to be Brian Keith versus Two Cold Scorpio and JTG versus Rich Swan. Okay, what happened? Uh, Scorpio and Swan ended up working the WrestleCon show instead. 
Oh, okay. So both of them ended up getting pulled from this show, and then they ended up adding Senshi and Mysterious Q, who ended up being the two people involved in the decision. Um, Brian Keith has been very hit and miss to me. He's one of those Texas guys that kind of uh, doesn't hasn't really ever stood out to me, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Like he's not bad, but he's not like somebody that I'm going to go out of my way to see perform. I like JTG. JTG has completely reinvented himself as a professional wrestler, getting away from the comedy shtick that was Crime Time, while still sticking true to his roots. Uh, he's in tremendous shape now, too. Dude is chiseled. And then um, Mysterious Q was the guy that broke out during the Black Sweatpants or the Gray Sweatpants Battle Royal that they did last year for the culture. Uh, with Faye Jackson that Faye Jackson hosted and since she actually is um, Shinron formerly a Shikara he mm -hmm. was also known as charade at one point and if you remember the YouTube video the bots video of the mm -hmm. wrestler trying to do the double backflip and landing on his head yeah that was him that was him Oof. how is he not dead uh, um, I just re recently rewatched the rewatched the clip with a friend of mine my buddy looked at me and said He's crippled, right? And I said, <laughs> nope, still wrestling today. Yeah, he's thanks to the lucky stars that he is. All right. So <laughs> the fun thing about GCW is that they'll have like no regular normal matches. But like from out of left field, they'll just throw a death match out there, <laughs> like, especially late in the evening. You know, we get to the main event. So I again, for the culture was not a death match show. It was a lot of normal matches with normal guys doing normal stuff. It was just a showcase for some independent, unknown, and you know, recently cut from NXT or uh, you know, AEW dark folk uh, African American wrestlers. So imagine my surprise when the main event is a death match between Hoodfoot and Billy Dixon, and uh, with the in the Hoodfoot one with the Border City stretch at almost twenty minutes. This was, I mean. This is what I was telling you about, like, death matches. When they're done in small quantities, they can be a lot of fun to watch. And after a show that was all fairly normal and not a lot of, fool, you know, tomfoolery, you know, they weren't constantly fighting in the crowd and whatnot. It was fun to see them go full on death match here. And I'll tell you what, I thought Hoodfoot was going to kill Billy Dixon. Like, I thought there was going to be a murder in, in that ring. This was... I've watched a lot of death matches, especially in the last couple of years. This was pretty brutal. This was up there. Uh, Hoodfoot was a mess by the end of this match, too. Yeah. Like, yeah, they, they both bled like stuck pigs. Disturbingly bloody. Uh, Dixon's kind of got a reputation for being a bleeder, so that wasn't really a mm -hmm. surprise. Uh, Hoodfoot, Mo Atlas, is he's relatively new to death match wrestling, but like Shug mm -hmm. pointed out. On commentary. And again, I got to give Shook credit. Shook pointed out on commentary. Uh, he's new, but he's got skin in the game because he was pointing out all the scars and stuff on Hoodfoot's back. Mm -hmm. But you could see during his entrance. Um, the one thing in this match that I absolutely despised, and I hate it in every death match that it happens in, is the mm -hmm. insistence on getting the referee involved in order to help you set up spots. Yeah, that takes me out of it, too. I, I hate it. it it's... The referee is supposed to be unbiased. The referee should not be helping you set up elements of destruction. Yeah, that makes sense. If you want to have somebody do that, have one of the members of the ring crew do it because that's what they're there for. They're there to help organize. They're there to help clean the ring. They're there to help you get situated there. The referee should not be doing that. It's a minor quibble, but it just, mm -hmm. like you said, it takes me out of the match seeing the referee get involved like that because it shouldn't be happening. Overall, I'm not unhappy. I watched Fall of the Culture. Um, it was fun to, the, the, uh, like the the match with the with the three and a half, you know, big guys. I'd never seen them wrestle before, to my knowledge, to my recollection, and so it was fun to see them. I liked the hood foot match. Um, I've, I've watched a lot of GCW over the past couple of years. This was by far not the worst one I've seen. I think in some ways it was a little, you know, if you take the the, the black element out of it and it's just matches, it was kind of just there. Um, there were there were definitely a handful of moments throughout the night, but um, it's kind of felt like a wrestling show, which is not a bad thing. You know, we we're here to watch wrestling, and so you get a halfway solid wrestling show. How much can you complain? My preference between the two is blood sport, and I'll give you the final word. So the issue that I have, and we kind of talked about this before when we were discussing covering this, mm -hmm. 
is I don't have an issue with having a show that focuses on the best black wrestlers in professional wrestling, the best mm-hmm. black wrestlers in independent professional wrestling. I have an issue with exploiting that fact. Okay. In what way was this exploitive? Um, it was a for the culture show. Was as he marks down the time of this particular segment in order to put it yep. on TikTok. The issue that I have with GCW I'm much right more now, interest. I'm much more interested in you calling the voluntarily black show with voluntarily black wrestlers somehow exploitive. I, th- this I got to hear. The issue that I have, and we've talked mm-hmm. about this before, is for the culture was a show for black wrestlers, for black fans, ran by a white promoter. Yeah. I have an issue with that because it seems like capitalizing on the urban culture in order to be able to profit off of it. Can I? All right. You know what? I wanted to go to bed, but you're a motherfucker. Um, <laughs> it's come, coming at me with these crazy arguments. I, where do you think people get opportunities from? You get opportunities from the people with the money. Guess who has the money in many situations? Fucking white people. There are plenty of black promoters that can do shows like this. Okay. So what are you supposed to do? Not take a gig? If a white I didn't promoter, say that. Oh, no, but what kills me about that argument, God bless you, brother. I, 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 I'm I just, I, I need to, I need to argue with you because I think it's ridiculous. Why does it matter who has the money if everyone's volunteering? And here's the other thing. If you're, you know, if you're talking about, well, there's plenty of black promoters out there running black shows. There's House of Glory. There's this, there's that. There's Terminus. Okay. Everyone's out to get paid. None of them are, are there at gunpoint. Why does it matter? Why do if the money is coming from a black hand or from a white hand or a Chinese hand? The truth. What the truth. fucking difference does it make? The whole point of the show isn't who gets to make the money at the at the end, who who the promoter is. The point of the show is to get people like me, you don't follow a lot of independent wrestling, to go, oh look, big fat black guys. Okay, well, but I want to the follow th- them and do the next thing that they do. Okay, so here's the thing though. We we decided to review this show because we wanted to do the collective. Yes. Realistically speaking. Honest answer. If we weren't reviewing this show for Rattle and Broadcast, American Whammy. Hold on. If we weren't reviewing this show for Rattle and Broadcasting, part of American Whammy production. Me, no, I'm not. Trouble. <laughs> no, I'm not. You know why? Because I'm the one saying it. And me and Brian can have that conversation. You, I bet you, bet you can. Leave me out of it. <laughs> <laughs> the point being is. What was I, you made me lose my point there? Okay, the point being is that we're doing this show for the sake of this podcast, for the sake of the indie siders here. Honest mm-hmm. answer time if we weren't reviewing this show for the sake of the indie siders, would you have watched it? Probably not, because honest. we are not the atomic, we are not the target demographic that, of this. Okay, show. but that's not a fair question. You're making an assumption, you're put, you're also putting words in my mouth now because the question your question is, well, would I? Would I have paid attention to this show if we weren't doing the review? But how much independent wrestling do you think I'm watching, Harry Broadhurst? You're the one that watches 80,000 hours of wrestling and nothing else. I have to watch 100,000 hours worth of movies and television. Also, I have to maintain a social life. Also, I have to be a husband. Also, I have to be a parent. And I have a full-time job. So excuse the fuck out of me that I didn't make, that I don't necessarily make the time to watch a lot of independent wrestling. If you will allow me to continue. Yes, sir before somebody hopped on his soapbox. Um, if we weren't reviewing this show for um, for the Indeciders, I wouldn't have watched it. That's you. But that how how does that relate back to Because your... I am not I am not the target demographic of this show. And I know that. And watching this show, I definitely felt like I was not the target demographic for this show. What does that have to do with your first point of it's exploitive because it's a white promoter. I don't see how either one of those things met. Like, I go back to what I said before. If you're going to do this kind of a show, I, I, I feel like if everybody except for the promoter is white, it, it potentially raises a problem to me. Similar to the, the – I have an issue with GCW running the FEC Big Gate Grunt shows for the exact same reason. Because it's opportunity it's, is opportunity, and if everyone if everyone volunteers, everyone takes look. See, I'll tell you why I have a problem with that argument. Okay, I'm listening. Not with you personally. We're having a friendly no, debate. Understand? Okay. 
My problem is, who the fuck are you <laughs> to tell Effie who we can wrestle for and who we can't wrestle for? Who the fuck are you to, tell, no Hoodfoot, one. to tell Hoodfoot that he should only wrestle for black promoters? Why don't you let Hoodfoot fucking make that decision? Oh, no, I didn't say he should only wrestle for black promoters. I said when you're going to present a show such as this, it, it should it, be presented by a black promoter. No, it shouldn't. No, it should be pre presented by the person who want, who has the money. <laughs> okay? Look, here's the thing. Go back go back 50 years. Go back 100 years. And all you have is white promoters. Uh, what are black what are black people supposed to do? Just not wrestle, not not be entertainers, did, not not give that. up an entire legacy of sports and entertainment because it was run by white people. I did you not know, say there, I you did have not the, say. You have the what was it was the all Negro League, the the baseball Negro League. Yes. Okay? I'm, I'm going to take a wild guess. The people behind that, but the money behind that were white people. What were, what were black people supposed to do? Like, fuck it. I'm not, I'm not going to play baseball. I mean, at, at some point, see, here, I guess the, the central core of my argument with this is it is up to the individual to make that decision. And they have choice. Nobody and, had to work the collective. And I absolutely, I absolutely agree with you. And I do not fault any of the athletes that appear on this show. Okay. However... Well, hang on before before you continue. But if a but if a promoter, white, black, Chinese, or Martian, decides I want to dedicate of the twelve shows we're doing, I want to dedicate one of them to showcase black wrestlers. Why is why is that inherently a bad thing according to you? Because he's white. Why are we? Why do we care what color the promoter is? Shouldn't the shouldn't what matters is it seems the, like the cap platform because it seems like capital capitalization on black culture. Okay, I hear what you're saying, but <laughs> if you don't, then nobody gets to be an entertainer. It only gets to be white people. Uh, no. Or uh, unless you can somehow convince the few black people who had managed to make money in this world to then promote the arts, you know, promote shows. And, you know, not everyone's going to take that gamble. Okay, so to the core element of this here. Yes. It's not that I have an issue with these kind of shows. It's not like I have an issue with For the Culture. It's not that I have an issue. I don't know if you remember last year there was a show called Black Wrestlers Matter. I don't, but I'm sure there was. Yeah. Um, and it was a all-black show presented by a black promoter. Yeah. I don't have an issue with those kind of shows running. I, I know I'm not their target demographic, however. Okay. Your, your central argument is... That if anyone's going to run a showcase show, they should be of the showcase minority. I agree. So like an yeah. all-women show, you should only have a women promoter. One, who are you to tell people how they can make money and, and what they can make money with? Two, is my counter-argument. Two, this is what... You can have a personal problem with it, and, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back away from you having a personal issue with it. It bothers I Harry Broadhurst. Pot bothers Harry Brothers. Things bother Harry Brothers. You're allowed to be bothered by things. It's fine. I think for me, coming from it from a more general point of view, where it's not my personal point of view, it's it's just a very libertarian uh, take on these things. People with money who want... Because here's the thing. The guys from GCW didn't have to do this. There were like, no, 87, I, they were like 87 shows here. I agree. They didn't have to do an all-black show. I think not that they should be grateful, but they should at least be appreciative of the opportunity because here's I the thing 12 shows, 10 matches per show, it seems like a lot. But when you're using AJ Gray 67 times and John Moxley 47 times, sometimes there's not a lot of room for Hoodfoot. Sometimes there's not a lot of room for the two meaty black men smacking meat. So when you do a showcase show, you make room for those, which right, I think is I, more important than who the fuck the promoter is. And all right, I'll give you I, the final word and then I'll shut up. I will give GCW credit on one format for this, though. Mm -hmm. uh, Brett Lauderdale was the promoter of the show. However, he did delegate most of the aspects of the show to AJ Gray. So I will give Lauderdale credit for that. Somebody, like in, has, somebody has to be the money, and I don't know why the color of the money makes any difference. I just don't feel like Lauderdale himself would have had his hand on the pulse of black culture, which is why I prefer that he 
he delegated that role to AJ Gray. <laughs> right, problem solved. What's the issue? <laughs> like I don't, I don't think white people should take advantage of black people. Okay, well, as a white person here, I'm gonna let the black guy take care of it, and I'll just be the money behind it. Me and the, and the, I, I think that that was the correct thing to do for Lauderdale. Okay, <laughs> why are you raising a stink? That's just he, in general. The idea of these <laughs> these concept shows annoys me. Okay. Well, you can have that opinion, and but when you start getting this, into like, well, oh, the promoter is the wrong color. This is getting into the heart of the matter for me. The idea of these okay. concept shows, and we talked about this when we originally discussed that we were going to do this show. Mm -hmm. We talked the, about it a little bit even on the FES Big Gay Brunch show where you're like, right, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of minority showcase shows. It's not that I'm not a fan of them. It's that I mm -hmm. feel like it's inclusion by exclusion, if that makes sense. No, yeah, and that's the argument you made on the FES Big Gay Brunch show. It's I, similar here too. Mm -hmm. um, there, what if these people? What if they had uh, dream matches against participants that are not of their skin tone? Does that mean that those people cannot be a part of the show in order no, to I have? Get your, dream I get your matches? point. There's not a lot of independent wrestling out there for those to have them to have those opportunities. <laughs> You're very snarky late at night. I feel like I preferred recording this earlier in the evening. Uh, I was I was less snarky when I recorded at 9 o'clock this evening. I'll give you that. Yes. <laughs> Jesse Starcher got the nice Mark Rattledge tonight. I got the asshole. Yeah, you got me after my wife came home from her date. Um, anyway, so <laughs> with that said, so that's blood sporting for the culture. Um Stay tuned for more ridiculous takes from yours truly <laughs> here in three weeks. Yeah. Uh, how are, Assuming how are, I haven't been canceled in the downtime. <laughs> we'll, we'll see how TikTok takes to this. Um, here, my question to you is, what music are you listening to these days? And please answer uh, briefly. Uh, mostly... Jeez, I'd, I'd have to look at my. I'd have to look at my. That's watches. great. Guns and Roses is a great band, and we know you can find <laughs> Guns and Roses on AmazonMusic.com, <laughs> where we're giving you a free 30-day trial of the Amazon Music Unlimited service. Like, get AmazonMusic.com/slash/WTMNetwork. Soon to be the w American Whammy Podcast Network. Get AmazonMusic.com/slash/WTMNetwork. Hey, tell your best buddies, the bosses, that we need new links reflecting our our rebranding i will i will inform them thusly thank you all right well that is it for your indie siders look at the wacky wonderful world of independent wrestling we will be in fact be back um we are recording it um so this is going to go up uh yeah, blah, 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 blah. this is going to go up saturday may uh, sorry friday may 6th so when you're listening to this you're listening to this now it's May 6th or after May 6th. Um, we're going to do the next show we're going to do is in uh, on the 23rd, but it'll air on the 28th. Uh, and that's going to be the best of the collective. Harry and I are going to do our darndest to watch the rest of the collective shows from um, WrestleMania weekend. And we'll pick out a couple of matches a piece. Yeah, I don't know if I'm getting through it all. Um, we'll pick out a couple of matches. It's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. Uh, and just kind of, you know, we'll kind of go back and forth. Maybe my top four, his top four uh, from the rest of the collective shows. I will say that there are two shows that I do think you should get to. The well, two I'm shows. Gonna, I'm definitely going to watch Planet Death. and I'm definitely going to watch The World on Lucha. What else? The, the two shows that I would highly recommend are Black Label Pro. Mm -hmm. Black Label Pro has a history of, perfoot, of putting on similar to AIW shows in that people you don't usually see in current day dependent wrestling mm -hmm. making cameo appearances as well as a up and coming stars. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the mission pro wrestling bangers only show, which is an all female show is uh, there are some really interesting look looking matchups on that one as well, that right. I'm, I'm curious um, I'm, to check out. I'm definitely going to do my best to check them out. Like I said, I'm my priorities are getting through Planet Death and uh, the World on Lucha, and then that Black Label Pro show was like third on my list. So uh, I will definitely check them out. All right. In the meantime, uh, please like and subscribe our YouTube channel. Like and subscribe. Um, we are. <clears throat> I mentioned at the top of the show, I'm, and when you have heard this, I will have mentioned it all week long. We are uh, rebranding W2M to American Whammy. 
Uh, so please continue to follow us on all the rebranded social media, our Facebook page, our Twitch, um, our Twitter. That's going to be American Whammy Media, American Whammy Podcasts. Uh, the Rattledge and Broadcasting Network will still be here. We just aren't going to be the Rattledge and Broadcasting Network anymore. We are part and parcel. We are Borg of American Whammy. So stay tuned for more content from all the great American I Whammy content this, providers. I thought this was just a distribution deal. No, I've lost my identity. I am no longer Mark Rattledge. I am now American Whammy. I am Borg. Go talk to your fucking best friend who decided he was in charge of this. <laughs> don't, don't blame me. I'm just following orders. I'm, I'm getting, getting out of this. Soldier. <laughs> I'm getting out of this one. I, I don't want any further parts in this. And I will be the first person to take the heat for calling it Rattledge and Broadcast through American Whammy Media. Okay. Because that's go what it should be. Go talk to your friend. Um, speaking of your friend, you do like 97 podcasts with him. Uh, well, I do more podcasts with Eric, uh, specifically. That's Not what so I was much. Talking about. I thought you meant Brian. No. Uh, meant Eric. Uh, Eric and we have Life is Like a Game Show tomorrow. We start Pressure Luck Month. Uh, third. It's not tomorrow. This is now Friday. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Make sure you guys check out the start of Pressure Luck Month. I forgot we're, we're live to tape here. My bad. Mm. Uh, make sure you guys check out the start of Pressure Luck Month. We're going to go through and cover all five iterations of Pressure Luck. The original version, which was called Second Chance, that's the one we're covering on May the 3rd. Um, Peter Tamarkin era, Whammy, the all new Pressure Luck with Todd Newton and the current iteration with Elizabeth Banks. We're also going to deep dive into the, one of the biggest game show scandals in television history with Michael Larson and the $117,000 game. That'll be a part of Life is Like a Game Show this month here on American Whammy Media. In addition, uh, myself and Eric have the Broadhurst Walking Sports Report. The newest episode will have aired the day before this on Thursday as we talk the fallout from the NFL draft, the start of the NHL playoffs, and we get closer and closer to crowning an NBA champion as we've hit the conference semifinals in addition to random other sports news notes and various assortia through that as well. And then I'm um, also occasionally not always a disembodied voice on point of viewer this past week's episode. That aired last Sunday. I was not part of due to not feeling well. I hope to be back. Is that in the two six days. hour one? What the fuck? No. How did I was there for the six hour one. And why did okay. it go six hours in ten words or less? Um, okay. Sports movie bracket final. Okay. Extent existentialism uh discussed. Reedy Creek Improvement District. The Disneyland story. Gotcha. No, I got it. We All did right, like uh, we did like two hours on pretty much each of the topics. Yeah, makes sense. And All that's right. why the, that's why they're being broken down into three separate episodes. Gotcha. All righty, folks. That is our, uh, our that is our show. That is our Indie Siders TV party for Bloodsport and for the culture for Harry Broadhurst, who wants to make sure you're not exploiting the minorities. It's very important to him. Uh, <laughs> Hate mail to s.garmer at gmail.com. Why don't you send it to your boss? Good old Eric. Um, <laughs> Sean ain't the boss. No one knows. Sean's only the boss of me. Okay. He's, not, be, he's, not, he's not the boss. That's, that's, to, your, that's your friend. To be fair, Eric and Jason used to do a show called Black Irish, which was far worse than anything I've said tonight. <laughs> yeah, you haven't gotten us your community strike yet. Yet. <laughs> I know better than to have shows playing in the background, Mr. Rattledge. Shut up. Um, <laughs> and on that note, be well, be safe, and behave.